Good evening. Welcome to Charter Township of Van Buren Planning Commission meeting for Wednesday, October 24th, 2018. We'll start with a roll call, please. Ms. Harmon. Joan Franzoy. Here. Jeff Jarr. Here. Donald Boynton. Here. Brian Kelly is excused. Medina Atchison. Here. Sherry Budd. Here. Carol Thompson. Here. Thank you very much. We have an agenda before us. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? So. So move. Commissioner Boynton, support. support. Commissioner Atkinson, any changes or additions to the agenda? All in favor of approving tonight's agenda as presented, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? And the agenda is approved. <coughs> we have minutes from the regular meeting of September 26th of 2018. Is there a motion to approve the September 26th minutes? To the chair, make a motion to approve the minutes as presented. Supported. Um, motion for Commissioner Budd, support Commissioner Boynton. Any corrections or changes to the minutes? All in favor of approving the September 26, 2018 minutes, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? And the minutes are approved. First item on tonight's agenda under new business is a final site plan approval. The applicant, Parallel Infrastructure, is requesting final site plan approval for the construction of a wireless communication facility it's a 125 foot tall monopole cell phone tower and associated support structures at 43430 Ecourse Road, Van Buren Township. The parcel number is V125 83 012 99 0028 000. This property is located around the northwest corner of Ecourse Road and Morton Taylor Road and is located in an R1B single family residential zoning district. We'll start first with the presentation by the applicant. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman, board members. My name is Jonathan Crane. I'm a civil engineer and an attorney, and I come before you on behalf of Pi Tower, who is doing a build to suit monopole structure 125 feet tall to be initially used by Verizon Wireless and to be available for co-location by other carriers. We were approved with a preliminary site plan and a special use on January 10th of this year. And then we started our odyssey with Wayne County, getting our soil erosion <laughs> and sediment control plan and driveway approach permit plans approved. Um, that approval was received last month late last month, and we were placed on the agenda for tonight for final site plan approval. When we came before you, the issues, of course, with Mr. Potter and the soil and the stormwater detention retention system, he had some recommendations. Um, his recommendations were very reasonable. The Wayne County then went, up, went from there and were very demanding, but we did finally meet their criteria. In addition, there were some concerns about plantings and we've added 55 five to six foot arbor vitae around the entire compound area. So you won't be seeing anything inside the compound. And it is close to 600 feet west, or yes, west of Morton Taylor and approximately 13 or 1200 feet north of um, Ecorse. Um, I'd like to ask you tonight to give us our final site plan approval so we can pursue getting our building permits and get this project underway. We're behind schedule and we're hopeful of having this site up yet this year. Thank you very much. I'll answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Crane. We'll hear the recommendations from McKenna and Associates and Fishbeck and then we'll see what kind of questions or comments we get. We'll start with McKenna first. Mr. Stone. Uh, thank you. Um, as the applicant had noted, um, the uh, Planning Commission uh, held a public hearing uh, last year, it was in September 2017, and uh, had recommended approval of the special land use permit. And uh, that special land use was approved by the Planning Commission on January 10th of 2018. And uh, I think shortly before then, um, they had their preliminary site plan approval, uh, which was in September 2017. So um, as the applicant noted, it's been some time, and I think a lot of it is on account of uh, going through the county, getting the permits. And uh, now that they're finished with the county, uh, they're able to come back to the township for their final site plan review and to tie up any conditions of approval. Um, at the uh, 
preliminary stage, we had some recommended conditions of approval uh, that have been satisfied by the applicant. Uh, they deal with um, the landscaping around the fenced area, um, having a maintenance agreement um, for that area, and uh, those have been satisfied uh, by the applicant. Um, our recommendation uh, is that the final site plan be uh, approved by the Planning Commission, uh, subject to the landscape maintenance agreement being acceptable to the township attorney. And the reason being is that uh, they have a certain easement area that, that they delineate on the plans, and uh, some of that landscaping is outside of those boundaries. So by having the landscaping easement, um, we can uh, be assured that the landscaping will be maintained and, if necessary, replaced. Uh, so that concludes our report, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. I think we'll go to Mr. Potter and see what Chris Thompson R and Huber have to say about the engineering. Thank you. Um, we uh, submitted a letter recommending uh, approval for engineering and final site plan review, and that letter is dated October 19th. Uh, during our review, we received <clears throat> multiple designs and, and various sets uh, of plans, in particular into the grading and the stormwater for the site. Uh, subsequent to Wayne County's approval, we reviewed what they uh, had consented to, and uh, uh, one of the comments we made in the letter is that uh, whereas the drainage appears to be functional based on, on what they're showing, uh, we are making a statement here that if the drainage ever does uh, impound or get impounded on the neighboring properties, that they've got a uh, revisit the situation. It's very flat out there, as you know. Uh, we had called for some cross culverts that were limited at, uh, during the Wayne County review. So we do have some, some general comments there that uh, as we get into the, um, the next phase of this is approved tonight, which would be uh, uh, the preliminary, uh, there, there's a checklist for the pre-construction uh, meeting that you'll receive. Uh, that we do want some of these items that we list here uh, reflected on the, those plans that should be noted issued for construction. We made the recommend, uh, recommendation tonight to move the project along. There's no fatal errors in this, but we would like some clarification. So um, we'll be following up with you as we proceed if, if the site gets approved tonight. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Potter. We also had a recommendation from the Fire Marshal McAnally. Um, you want to go over that for us, Mr. Boynton? From uh, David C. McNally, the second fire marshal of Van Buren Township, a uh, letter dated October 11th of 2018. Um, I have reviewed the revised site plan for the project overview. The plans indicated a single monopole 125 foot tall with a 1,000 pound propane tank on site, NFPA 1 2012 and NFPA 101 2012 are the adopted fire codes for Van Buren Township. Um, one, Knox Lock, which can be purchased from www.knoxbox.com is required on the gate. Uh, number two, fire department access road shall be designed and maintained to support the imposed loads uh, of 77,000 pounds of fire apparatus and shall be provided with an all-weather driving surface. Fire department access roads shall have an unobstructed vertical clearance of not less than 14 feet. Plans show a couple of existing trees that will be hanging over the access drive. These trees need to be maintained at the requested height per the fire code and AHJ. Per our fire department, the site plan submitted has been approved. Review and approval by the authority having jurisdiction shall not relieve the applicant of the responsibility of compliance with these codes. Great, thanks. So a couple of other conditions from fire department, some from the planners, and some from the engineers. Um, questions or comments for the applicant or for any of the staff? Mr. Crane, any of the um, conditions or follow-up that uh, are a concern to you or your 
your people? We'll meet all the concerns. Okay. All right. Anyone in the audience? Questions or comments? If there's nothing else on this application, um, is the commission ready to make a motion? Madam Chair. Commissioner Boynton. I move that we grant the applicant parallel infrastructure final site plan approval for the construction of a wireless communication facility, which is a 125 foot tall monopole cell phone tower and associated support structures located at 43430 Ecourse Road in Van Buren Township, Michigan, parcel number V-125-83-012-99. Um, located around the northwest corner of Ecorse Road and Morton Taylor Road and located in an R1B single family residential zoning district subject to the recommendations of the following letters from McKenna and Associates dated October 19th of 2018 um, from Fishback Thompson Carr and Huber letter dated October 19th of 2018 and the review from Fire Marshal David C. McNally II dated October 11th of 2018. There's a motion, is there support? Support. Commissioner Fransoy. Any discussion on the motion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. We look forward to your future success. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. Thank you. Next item on tonight's agenda, under new business, the applicant is the Belleville Yacht Club. They are requesting site plan approval to build an accessory building and a pool. The parcel number is V-125-83-088-99-0028-0029-0029-0029-0029-0029-0029-0029-0029-0029-0029-0029-0029-0029-0029-0029-0029-0029-0029-0029-0029-0029-0029-0029-0029-0029-0029-0029-0029-0029-
permitted land uses or use by rights within the R1C zoning district. Um, due to this, these uses are both allowable uses on the site and have the ability to be approved by the township via the Planning Commission. Um, the township zoning ordinance requires that the applicant obtain site plan approval as, as were before now for accessory structures, building uses when the principal use of the property also requires site plan approval. Um, as we had considered before, uh, the, the BYC is considered under the country club use on, in our zoning ordinance. Um, and because that use requires site plan approval, that's why we're considering the, the pool and the shed as well. One item that I wanted to highlight uh, originally, I know when we see these site plan reviews, they typically come following a letter with the engineer or the fire marshal. Um, I actually had spoken to the engineer regarding this project and, and they had indicated that because it's such a small scope and because um, actually the swimming pool will hold more stormwater than it'll discharge, um, that there is no need for engineering review for the swimming pool. In addition to that, there's going to be no utilities being impacted, and uh, as I had indicated, the swimming pool isn't going to add to stormwater runoff. I had also spoken with the fire marshal about whether or not they needed to conduct a review on the site, and, and uh, Fire Marshal McAnally indicated that he did not need to do a formal review of the site plan. However, he was going to do a walkthrough of the site. Um, so, the, and that has occurred, and I'll touch on that later in the review. Regarding landscaping, the property was reviewed in 2017 um, when the Tiki Bar building was originally approved. At this time, the landscaping was reviewed and a few trees and shrubs were required to be added to bring the property in compliance with their zoning ordinance standards. Um, and as these standards haven't changed between that approval and this approval, uh, staff is, is proposing to verify that the plannings were completed during our site walkthrough. The swimming, with regards to the swimming pool, there are standards in our zoning ordinance for private swimming pools uh, outlined in section seven. Uh, I've listed them on the staff report. I'll touch on them briefly um, as, as some of them are fairly general related to building code requirements. Uh, there is a building permit required to put in a swimming pool, which the Belleville Yacht Cup has already applied for. Um, it's currently being held waiting on the planning commission's decision. Um, the port swimming pool does not impact any easements or rights away as it is located towards the back of the property and it is on their private property and not the township property. Um, there are minimum set setback requirements uh, for pools uh, with regards to adjacent buildings and with regards to property lines. Um, they state that the pool fence shall not be built within the required front yard or required corner lot side yard um, and the rear side yard setback should not be less than 10 feet between the pool wall and our structure and the side or rear property line um, or less than four feet between the pool wall and any building on the lot. So based on our review of the site plan, uh, the edge of the pool is located in the rear yard of the property. It is about 56 feet and approximately 45 feet from each side property line. And then it's also located approximately 75 feet from the 655 elevation contour on the lake side. So, so it is clearly within their property and it meets all the required setbacks. Um, in addition to it, there, in addition to those setbacks, there is a five foot distance between the edge of the pool and the adjacent uh, Tiki building, um, which also meets the required setback of four feet between the pool edge and any buildings on the property. So based on this, the, the pool is compliant with all setback requirements in the ordinance. The next standard that they look at is, is with regards to pool barriers, and this is mirrors what's in the state building code. Um, any pool is required to have a 48, a minimum 48 inch uh, tall fence surrounding it, and it has to have a gate with a self latching gate. As they had demonstrated on the site plan, the fence is going to be five feet in height. It's going to be a decorative aluminum fence, and they're going to have uh, the, the gate that they had called out on the site plan is, is a self latching. It's a, a magnetic gate that is approvable under the building code. So based on that, they've met this requirement. Um, there's other standards regarding code comments and electrical installations, which I won't go into. If there's any permits that are necessary, they'll be applied for and inspected by our building department. Um, one of the other comments that was made in the standard is requirements with any other federal, state, county, or local codes and, and what the I'll recommend is that the Planning Commission condition any approval on the applicant obtaining not any necessary permits to complete the work. Um, they've already applied and received a DEQ permit for the work, um, but if there's any other permits that are out there, we'll, uh, I'll recommend that approval be conditioned upon that. 
Well, the next series of comments that I have are with regards to the detached shed. Um, you know, just going through some of our zoning ordinance standards that we have for those sheds. Uh, it's located in the side of rear of the property, which is compliant. Um, in the R1C zoning districts, uh, the minimum required setbacks from a side property line is five feet. And based on the site plan, the shed does not meet the setback. Um, as I had indicated before, Fire Marshal McAnally did a walkthrough of the site. And, and part of our preliminary discussion, because I'll, I'll tie it, a little bit later down the shed uh, review it is a portable shed and it's not required by our zoning ordinance to be on a permanent foundation so it is movable um, and so our original discussion was to you know have the shed be five feet from the property line the concern of the fire marshal was that if the shed comes closer to the building that they wouldn't have access on the uh, they wouldn't have fire department access for a truck if they ever needed to get back there so as we go further on down the uh, review and my recommendation, we're going to um, offer, ask the planning commission if they would consider authorizing us uh, to authorizing the approval of a shed, some more size and dimensions, and then grant myself and the fire marshal the ability to work with the applicant to place it on there, um, place it on the site in an area that meets our zoning ordinance and our fire code. It's a, it's a relatively small portable shed um, something that you would consistently see in, in single family homes. Uh, it, obviously if it, um, if it wasn't for a, if it was, wasn't for a non single family use, this would be something that we would be able to, uh, approve through our, our building official. So, so that's, that's part of the rationale for, for what we're asking. Um, the height of the shed is it's a proposed pre-built shed less than 10 feet in height. Um, so it's compliant with maximum height requirement of 14 feet. We did lot coverage review, which is in our staff report, but based on that lot coverage review, we um, had found that it did not uh, exceed the required, the maximum lot coverage for the zoning district. Uh, the standard uh, with regards to a concrete floor and rat wall, our zoning ordinance actually only requires a concrete floor and rat wall for a shed if the shed is located on a residential parcel less than 2.5 acres in area. Um, as this property is 4.04, .04, it exceeds that, and that's not a requirement that they're going to have to follow. One additional comment that I wanted to highlight to the Planning Commission was uh, with regards to screening on the site. Um, a modification was made with regards to screening. Uh, initially, when the BYC went through with the, the Tiki building, they had proposed leaving up some of the trees and the shrubs and evergreens that they have on the site. Um, Based on a discussion I've had with the applicant, uh, they had indicated that the neighbor to the east had actually requested that they place an opaque fence on the property instead of maintaining that vegetation. Um, so the applicant had actually installed an opaque fence to, to satisfy the adjacent neighbor. So that was one difference from the prior site plan that I wanted to highlight to the Planning Commission. So based on the above comments, um, you know, our main concern was the proposed location of the detached shed and site, but as it will not be attached to a permanent foundation, it's, it's a smaller size and portable. Um, we are, staff is asking if the planning commission would consider granting approval for the shed and then have myself and the fire marshal work with the applicant to determine a location that meets the fire code and the zoning ordinance. Uh, so based on that, staff recommends that the Planning Commission approve case 18-030 for the BYC to construct a swimming pool in accordance with the provided site plan dated October 19th, 2017 with the following conditions is that A, that the Planning Commission authorizes them to place a 12 by 40 prefab storage shed subject to this location being reviewed by myself and the fire marshal and that the applicant obtain all required permits from the county, state, or federal government. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions regarding the request. Great. Thank you so much. Questions or comments from the commission for the applicant or for Director Aker? Madam Chair. Commissioner Moynton. Um, <clears throat> good evening. The shed, um, will it be used all year, or is this going to be seasonal, such as when the pool is not in use and it's, for storage over the winter and whatnot, since you mentioned it's going to have mostly towels and chairs for, and things of that For nature. sure, the winter time we'll store the towels. We do pull our cushions. We're closed on Monday and Tuesdays, so we typically pull our cushions off all the chairs on Sunday evening and then put them back out Wednesday. So the cushions would be going in and out continuously. Okay, all year? Year round, yes. Okay. 
Um, next question. The, um, <clears throat> the pool in relation to the tiki bar. Yes, sir. Um, I couldn't see where it was on the drawing, really. So, uh, this is the existing tiki bar structure. I don't mean to block anybody. <laughs> that, that's all right. The concrete at, uh, that you see is the edge around the pool, and then this is the pool. So, I see that. But where's the bar at? Right here. This building, existing. Um, oh, oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, yeah, it just says foundation. The existing concrete foundation. That's the tiki bar. Okay. And then this is our main building. Oh yeah, I got that. And okay. Post shed would be. Okay. Next question. Okay, that's good. Let me get you back to the microphone there. Um, next question. How? What would be the ease of access going in between the bar and the pool? There's a. Um, we have a, a brick paver path, five mm -hmm. feet wide currently, is uh, the access from the main building to the tiki bar. And then the pool is five feet off of that. Okay. Um, my main concern is someone having a fantastic night at the tiki bar and then deciding to go take a dip in the pool. There's a five foot fence between, and we also have a power cover on the pool. So when the pool's closed, we have a power cover that uh, comes over the pool. Are the tiki bar and the pool open during the same time? Um, the pool, um, we haven't established the pool hours yet, but mm -hmm. the tiki bar will be open later than the pool. So yeah, they will, there will be times they're both open, but there's also a five feet fence, or five foot fence between the two as well. Yep, yeah, that, the I get that. Gate. And the gate will just have a magnetic lock on it. Is that something that someone's going to have to buzz them in, or are they going to have to put a card in? There's a latch on the top that you pull <clears> that <throat> separates the magnet and allows the gate to open. Okay. I'm just concerned about, and I'm, I'm, I'm not saying you guys don't run a good ship. I, I, I you know, I'm sure understood. you do, but I'm, I'm thinking on the safety portion of this. You know, like I said, someone having a fantastic night at the bar, and they kind of roll out of there and decide to take a dip in the pool, and now we may have an incident. So, I just primarily want to kind of bring that to the attention. I'm asking you to come up with a resolution now, but just no, keep, keep that on the forefront of okay. um, the planning and the um, making sure that we safeguard, you know, everyone there. Understood. And I appreciate the comments. We, we did talk about that and um, a main reason why we wanted the power cover because when the pools close, we can control that and we don't have to worry about that. In addition to that, we have the lake front, obviously, so another large part of body of water on the property, and we kind of, mm -hmm. it's got a hill in between our tiki bar and it, so both are concerns, and I appreciate the comments, but I think we've, we've addressed that with the power cover, and it's our intention that when the pool's closed, it will be covered. Okay. Well, that's good, and I'm glad to hear that. Let's just make sure we keep at the forefront of thought the overlapping period when the power cover is not on and the bar is open. Understood. Very good. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner Boynton. Other questions or comments from the commission? Anyone in the audience? There's nothing else. Is there a motion? <laughs> sure. All right, Commissioner Dark. The uh, applicant, Delbo Yacht Club, requesting site plan approval to build the accessory, accessory building the pool. Today. We will give the uh, grant that request at parcel number D12583088990. Uh, the site being approximately 3.98 acres, located in the R1C single family residential district. Uh, located on the north side of Huron River Drive between Edgemont and Martinsville Road. Uh, subject to the recommendations uh, made by staff in the memo dated October 20th, 2018. Commissioner Bud. Okay, just before we um, vote on the motion, I want to make sure that we're clear that we are um, asking Director Akers and Fire Chief McAnally 
to figure out the final placement with the applicant of the um, detached shed. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. All in favor of uh, approving the motion, please say aye. Aye. Any those? All right. Good luck. Probably won't be swimming until next year, but be safe. <laughs> Next item, number three on tonight's agenda, is a temporary land use approval. The applicant, Costco Wholesale Corporation, is requesting temporary land use approval to construct temporary container parking on the east side of their existing truck depot. The location is 5860 Belleville Road. Property is located on the west side of Belleville Road between Van Buren, Van, I'm sorry, Van Bourne Road and Michigan Avenue. And we'll start with the presentation by the applicant. Daniel Free with B3 Companies. We're the civil engineering consultants for Costco Wholesale. Um, here with uh, Todd Shields. How are you doing? He's the uh, assistant depot manager at the Costco depot. And tonight uh, we're asking approval for the uh, temporary land use. And um, the basic concept, what we're looking for here is there's just some additional parking that Costco needs for the uh, holiday season. And they, they want to have add some temporary parking here. Right now, we're currently working on plans. Uh, we've talked a little bit with Ron Akers uh, regarding the, a permanent parking solution on this, at the southwest corner of the site that will, um, is going under a separate process. But in the meantime, we wanted to have a temporary solution to the parking issue that Costco has. And so we are here to ask uh, approval for the um, adding this basically a, a stone section on a building pad for uh, Costco's, for a future building pad that Costco had already planned in uh, during the initial construction of the Costco Depot. Right now, the plan you have in front of you kind of shows the outline. It's less than an acre of disturbance, and the area will basically pull back the sod that's been planted and then install the uh, aggregate. We're working with the, or we will be working with um, Dave Potter to figure out what the cross section of the stone is. We'll also be providing a dust control plan and an engineer's opinion of cost in order to have a performance bond for the work. And um, that's all outlined in the memo from Ron Akers. And the, uh, eventually that uh, will be removed within 30 days of the completion of the permanent parking that I mentioned, or one year uh, max <coughs> after approval. Um, just want, one thing that I, I did want to change from what's noted on here is that the, uh, it's and shown on the drawing is that it says the east side of the existing truck depot. We would like to change that to actually be the west side of the truck depot. It's actually further from Belleville Road, and it's it'll be instead of on the future wet edition, the the cold side of the depot. We would like to put that on the dry side of the depot on the west side because that's the building addition that Costco will be pursuing next year. I'll be here for any questions you may have. Great. Thanks very much. We'll uh, hear the um, recommendation from staff, Dr. Akers. So I'm going to go through my memo dated October 20th. Um, our review is based on the east side of the depot and the proposed parking area on the east side of the depot. Um, however, the east and the west side mirror each other. And, and in all truthfulness the west side would be a less impactful um, area to do this as it's set further back from the road it's set further back on the site and it's adjacent to vacant property in the railroad to the south and then other industrial uses around and, and vacant property uh, that costco owns actually to the east so um, i'm going to do the i'm going to go through the review for the east side but a lot of the comments um, based on the west side or, or will be fairly similar. Okay. Um, so the 
wholesale depot is requesting a temporary land use permit for the temporary parking and storage containers and truck trailers 5860 Belleville um, as we know any temporary land use that operates more than seven consecutive days does require planning commission approval um, in addition to this temporary land use to park truck trailers they are proposing to construct a temporary gravel parking area which will be removed at the completion of their use um, and that area is proposed to be 40,500 square feet. So based on that review um, in section seven, based on that in section 7.12 of the zoning ordinance, we're going to go through the 14 standards of approval that we have for these, uh, these temporary land uses. Um, item number one talks about adequacy of parking and access. Uh, if they're adding truck parking spaces, they're, they're, improving that situation so that's not going to be a concern for staff um, item number two discusses adequate drainage I will say that back in 2015 when the site plan was originally approved the two grass areas on both the west and the east side of the building were reviewed as part of the site's whole stormwater um, retention plan and those two sites um, were both accounted for in the volume that the detention pond is required to have so because of that, um, you know, I, I, I don't have any concerns that the, um, that the addition of the gravel area is going to cause any issues with stormwater retention on the site. Um, I will, however, ask that they do provide a cross section of the gravel parking area so that we can make sure that that area that they're improving is, is in fact draining correctly and that it's built to be able to support the, the semi truck traffic. Um, so what I've asked in my review is that, uh, if the Planning Commission considers approval, that the owner provide a cross-section of the gravel parking area uh, to be reviewed by the township engineer. Regarding compatibility with surrounding land uses, the property is zoned M2, um, and it's surrounded by industrial uses, vacant land, and railroad tracks on all sides. Um, the east side of the property is located on Belleville Road, and it's adjacent to the existing Bayloft facility, which is also an industrial use. Um, and, and as many of you know, as you drive down Belleville Road, you can see the building off in the distance, but the visibility is very limited. Um, so a lot of the landscaping that was required to be installed back in 2014, 2015 is, is doing what it's intended to do. Um, so because of that, staff doesn't anticipate any you know, issues with surrounding land uses and adjacency. Um, however, we do, we are going to recommend that if the Planning Commission considers approval that they do provide a, a dust control schedule and plan for the temporary parking area as a condition of approval. Um, certain materials, uh, with, especially with gravel parking areas, especially if you have a, a, a few weeks of dry conditions, can get dry if you're moving traffic back and forth, um, you can get dusty. Um, on the east side, it was going to be a lot closer to the bailoff facility. If they're proposing it on the west side, it'll still be a little bit further back. But we staff feels that we still should have some type of dust control plan, so that way they're they're applying either calcium chloride or spraying water to make sure that uh, that that doesn't you know become a hazard or a nuisance to the adjacent areas. Um, I'm going to skip all the way down to item number eleven. Um, the approval should be conditioned upon the applicant obtaining any required permits from Wayne County, the state of Michigan, or the federal government, and that will be recommended as a condition of approval. Um, item 15 on page 3 talks about the necessity of a performance bond to ensure prompt removal. So in the application, the applicant's proposing to have this area restored um, within 30 days of completion of the parking area and the addition. Um, what staff is recommending that the township do is that we put a, a deadline of 30 days after completion or one year, whichever is less. Um, and the reason why is because, you know, I, I know the applicant has every intention of applying for a, a land use application, but if something happens and they don't, we want to be able to have that hard date to be able to, to hold them accountable to. Um, and on top of that, Generally, once something goes past a year, it stops being a temporary land use and becomes a little bit more of a permanent land use. Um, so we've, we've asked that they provide an engineer's opinion of probable cost for the restoration of the site from gravel back to uh, sodded and, and, uh, and uh, have, have grass on it. Um, 
and that opinion of cost we're recommending is going to be reviewed by our township engineer and we're asking that they provide a performance bond for the value of the work um, so that way we have the ability to um, ensure that it gets restored at the end of that that period item 16 addresses what i just said uh, with regards to the one year 30 days whichever is less um, just just in the event that not only if they don't apply but also if they apply and don't receive approval for one reason or another um, so one thing that i will add and again this is something that the planning commission has to consider um, if the planning commission is willing to consider it moving to the west side of the building um, i would recommend that they provide a revised drawing which depicts the an inaccurate um, indication of what they're proposing to do so with that um, based on the review staff is recommending approval um, with the six conditions that, that we had discussed they provide a, a revised plan which depicts not only the new area but ensures that they have adequate access and what measures they're going to take to ensure those access areas stay open um, we actually, I, may, I believe I skipped over that in my initial review, but um, the area that they proposed has truck parking on the areas that they're going to be maneuvering semi-trucks through. And we want to make sure that, A, you know, those areas are clearly identified for no parking, so that way, you know, they're not going to be able to block access in and out. And, B, we want to know how, how, what the plan is to do that. Um, so that's comment number one. Number two is regarding the cross section of the parking area to be reviewed by the township engineer. Three is the dust control schedule uh, and plan for temporary parking area. Four is the engineer's opinion of cost and pro pro uh, providing a performance bond. Five is that the temporary gravel parking area shall be removed no later than 30 days after the completion of the proposed parking and building expansion or prior to October 24th, 2019, whichever comes first. And that six, the applicant obtain all necessary county, state, and federal permits uh, necessary to perform the work. Um, so with that, I'd be happy to take any questions the Planning Commission may have. Great. Thank you so much, Director. Questions or comments from the Commission? Yes. Mr. Chair. How George. did we arrive at I, Thanks for catching the, the expiration clause after one year. But how, why did you decide one year? Why is it one year instead of three months or six days? Um, typically... In, 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 in our ordinance doesn't specify one year. Um, other ordinances I've worked with uh, have consistently used one year as, as that deadline where if it goes past one year, um, that is, you know, it, it stops becoming temporary at that point. The other side of it, uh, the other uh, rationale for it is that that takes them through the end of the next construction season so by all accounts they should have the depot up they should have the parking area up at that point if they're going to go through site plan approval over the winter months what happens if the construction is in progress in process we haven't passed the 30 days and it's 30 days out from completion but the year has expired do we need to then re-grant the temporary use they will be coming back before us to re-grant the temporary use Okay, and that doesn't cause any problem with it being a temporary use longer than a one-year period, right? Not if the Planning Commission, uh, we would, at that point, what we would do is we'd look at their construction schedule, and then we would more than likely recommend granting approval for whatever their constru yeah, remaining yeah, construction yeah, schedule is. I just want to make sure from a, yeah. from a technical standpoint that doesn't present a problem. There's no... Uh, there's no issue with your construction running into that period. No. We don't want to get you tripped up anywhere. Well, what I, what I, the, and the reason why, you know, we put the one year deadline in is I didn't want to leave an open ended Very good. temporary mm -hmm. land use because that could cause issues. Okay, thank you. Good question. Anyone else? Questions or comments? Anything, Mr. Potter? We've got uh, some assignments for you in this recommendation. Everything seems good? Okay. Anyone in the audience, questions or comments for the a this application? All right. Nothing else. Is there a motion? Madam Chair. Commissioner Boynton. <laughs> I grant that we. 
I'm sorry, I move that we grant um, is this temporary land use approval to the applicant Costco Wholesale Corporation uh, to construct a temporary container parking on the east side, on the west side west of side. the existing uh, truck depot. Um, location being 5860 Belleville Road, located at the west side of Belleville Road between Van Bourne and Michigan Avenue. Pursuant to the recommendations from uh, Director Ron Akers, um, dated October 20th of 2018, and along with the letter of review and approval from David C. McAnally, Fire Marshal of Van Buren, uh, fire department dated October 19th of 2018 and that also the modification um, that Director Aker stated in recommendation number one that the applicant provide a revised plan for the west side um, approval, correct? Yes. Okay. Great. We have a motion. Is there support? Support. Commissioner Franzoy. Any discussion on the motion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, gentlemen, <coughs> get out there and make those holiday sales. We are to item number four on tonight's agenda, which is the public participation plan that Ms. Moore has been working diligently on for quite a while, quite a while. It's an impressive plan as we look through it. Do you want to walk us through it, please? Yes. Um, so to begin with the public participation plan, I wanted to give a quick overview of it again, kind of similar to what I gave a couple months ago when I was here, but this way it just kind of refreshes everybody's memory what it is. So really, it's a formal commitment to public participation in the township in our planning and development processes. We already do that. There's a lot of ways we already do that, but this puts them all in one place um, so that both we can look and see what we do and people in the community can look and see what we do. And then also, with all those in one place, it really just works as a proactive guide um, of here's all the things we can look at, here's what we need to do. Um, and so really, um, when you look at who it affects, it's going to co coordinate public participation efforts across um, township departments, but primarily it's going to be the planning and economic development department. Um, for example, Parks and Rec will, might use it to update their master plan. They'll need to follow certain steps. But if you look at other things, like the senior center isn't going to be required to send out notices because they're doing a certain event. So primarily it's going to be planning and economic development. Um, also, just a few of its benefits is that it builds trust between the community and township government so people know what's going on. It's not like we're trying to um, get anything past people in the township without them knowing what's happening. Um, it also helps to minimize disputes because it addresses concerns before it gets to the public hearing a lot of times. So it kind of, um, for large development projects, offers more of a chance to have a conversation between people in the community and developers. So if there's concerns, if there's questions, they can talk it out then. Um, and also, it helps us to earn the Redevelopment Ready Community Certification from the MEDC, which really um, is a way to signal that our community is um, willing and ready for investors to come in. And also, then, the MEDC will help us to market specific sites for development to come in. So then, now I'll go over um, the content of the plan. So actually, if everybody looks in their packet, every, um, everyone on the commission should have the um, printed out plan in there. So if you look on page two, um, that's where we have our goals. And in adopting these goals, um, we didn't just randomly pick some bunch of goals. We really looked at the MEDC's guide um, and looked at their sample goals and tried to adapt those to fit Van Buren Township. So um, in doing so, I worked with Director Akers and then the Director of Public Services, um, Matt, and also the other intern, Melissa. So really the purpose of these goals is to provide that proactive guide that I talked about and also just to inform community members um, of how they can get involved and how we're trying to keep them to, um, involved. 
So the goals then are the first one is to guide Van Buren Township in a direction supported by community members. The second is to create a transparent environment for planning and development. The third is to utilize various outreach methods to reach a diverse group of community members. Um, the fourth is to coordinate public participation practices across township departments, like I've already spoken of. The fifth is to proactively select the tool or the tools appropriate for specific planning and development scenarios. And then the last one is to really just be in constant communication with the community regarding participation results using their feedback to update this plan. So really this plan is flexible so it can be updated um, as we get feedback from people and feedback from different people in the township too as to what works and what doesn't. So then the next section really um, just talks about the state regulations that form the basis of public participation. Um, and that would be the Michigan Open Meetings Act, the Michigan Planning Enabling Act, and then the Michigan Zoning Enabling Act. And those are just three pieces of legislation that really um, set the minimum requirements of what we need to do when we're um, communicating with people in the public about our planning. Really it comes down to open meetings, um, holding public hearings, and also sending out notices. So this is just a way to say, we know what the minimum requirements are, we're for sure meeting these, and then later on in the plan, here's how we're going to go above and beyond it. So then the next part of the plan, which is on page six of the plan, um, what they wanted, what the MEDC um, kind of showed us that we should do when we're writing one of these plans is we should compile a list of the key stakeholders in the community. And this is a pretty broad list of people that would be affected by development or groups that would be affected, affected by the development um, or that we really want to make sure that we don't leave out. So there's some local government in there um, ranging from Wayne County um, all the way to like the city of Belleville's in there because they're right next to us and so they have a stake in what we do. And then also local organizations. Um, there's um, an organization for people with disabilities in there. There's, um, we put like local service organizations in there that we were really hitting everybody that we think we might need to speak to at some point. And these are also organizations that as we're trying to gather different input from the public, they can help us gather groups of people together to talk to. Then we move into what is called the communication toolbox, which really is a pretty big section that speaks about um, what the different categories of engagement are, how we can choose a category, and then um, how we can choose a specific tool within that category. So the first thing in this is a chart that is actually taken from the EPA called Determining the Right Level of Public Participation. It has five levels that range from inform all the way to empower. Um, and then has questions so that you can decide which one is the best for this situation. I think something important to point out with this is just because inform doesn't give community members maybe as much say in something as empower, that doesn't mean that it's not always appropriate. You just have to look at the situation and say, when do I just need to inform? When do we need to move on to consult or involve, collaborate, or empower? So then once you decide on one of those, um, we really can look at our guide to choosing a strategy, which lists each of the options um, for public engagement in each of those categories. So on page eight, you can see that guide. Um, anything that is in bold is legally mandated, so we're for sure going to do that. And then you can move on and say, what else might be good for this situation? For example, where it says consult, it has surveys. Um, we, we've just gotten the results back from the master plan survey. So that was something that we said, okay, we're not legally mandated to do this, but this is gonna be a really great way to really talk to people in the community and learn what they want um, in our master plan update. And then after that is a description um, of each of those tools that I've talked about. So it has the category and form um, is the first one, and then all of the tools that we have listed in there with a couple bullet points under each that says what it is um, and kind of how you do it. I will point out that all of the tools in there are not things that we're currently doing. We wanted this to be um, both somewhere we could say here's these things we're doing but also as we move forward and maybe we can um, have a little bit more capacity and community engagement then here's these other things that we can do. We don't have to go out and find them, we already have them here. So it's kind of just some best practices for community engagement that we've included in there. So then if you move on to page 13 in the plan, it actually talks about outreach guidelines. And um, I had talked about this 
both the first time I presented the concept of the plan and then also last um, month when I came to the commission and, and asked um, for them to decide on definition of a large development project. So we thought it would be appropriate to have um, really just guidelines of what to do in certain scenarios that come up quite often. So some of them are township planning projects. So something like a master plan update really affects the whole township. So we want to make sure that there's opportunity for people to come and say, hey, here's what I'd like or what's going on. So we came up with the steps in that one that at the beginning you just um, you just focus on informing people. So you say, hey, we're going to send out these mailings. We're going to do a cable notification. Um, we're going to have a public information meeting of what's going on. And then in the middle, you really speak with people and kind of vet out alternatives, whether that's a survey that we're doing or maybe a town hall meeting where people can have a little bit more of a conversation with township staff. Um, and then you work towards building consensus. And finally, then you hold the public hearing, which is the, would be the one legal required requirement in that. Then you look at something like a public infrastructure project, so repaving road that really affects people can throw off their daily routine. So again, it's really focusing on informing people, but also giving them um, all the appropriate information they need. So if they have more questions or they have concerns, they know who they can speak with about that. So those are the two things that would be from the township. And then there is a controversial large development project, which is what we spoke at, about at the last meeting. Um, and based on the commission's input, we came up that a controversial development is characterized by one or more of the following factors. Um, either it is large in size relative to the surrounding developments, um, its proximity to the residential areas, its proximity to Belleville Lake, or it's a new development in an established area. So really we figure that kind of gives us flexibility um, and discretion so that the planning director can look at those and say, okay, if it meets one of these, then we need to um, follow the following steps and have the developers reach out to the community. Um, and the steps that we came up for them is that they would have a pre-application meeting with planning staff to really discuss, hey, here's what you need to do to reach out to people. Um, then they would have a public informational meeting that would be kind of a town hall set up so they can, people can ask questions, they can get answers, um, and really just talk out all of their concerns. Um, and then the developer would have a follow-up meeting with the planning staff to address um, any concerns that they learned about from the community. So those were the steps that we thought would be um, good for current controversial developments. Um, but also we realized that there are some development projects that though they might be large, they're not necessarily controversial. For example, um, if a large industrial development or a large warehouse goes in, but it's only in an area surrounded by other large warehouses, it's not necessarily going to be controversial. So at the um, discretion of the planning director, um, even if something's large, it might not necessarily have to follow all those public participation steps. Um, but obviously, if there was controversy, then we would, we would handle it. Um, but that way, it just kind of gives a little leeway for the planning director um, because everything's not black and white in how um, development happens and the kind of concerns people have. So then the next section of the plan really talks about how to communicate results from this public participation back to the community um, because it's not enough just to initially hear what people have to say. We need to let people know that also we're listening to you and we haven't just listened to you for the, like for the sake of, oh, we had to listen to you and now we don't care. Like we want people to know, hey, we listened to you and we care and we're taking it into account. So this chart, um, table 1-2, which is the guide to communicating results on page 15, um, it really just talks about the different um, community engagement events we would have and then how you would report those back um, to the public. So for example, public meetings, you post the meeting minutes on the township website. Um, but say we did something in the future like a pop-up engagement event, then we'd say, hey, here's a summary of the community's concerns and questions that we were discussed. We'll also post that on the website. So it really just tells people if they were at an event um, and they want a summary of it or they want to know what happened, here's how you can find out what happened. Um, finally, on page 17, we'll move on to future initiatives, which is um, just things the township would like to eventually undertake. One of them is to consolidate the social media. We found out while we were doing this that a lot of the departments have their own social media accounts, um, but we think in the future it would be really good for the township to consolidate, consolidate that into one unified social media presence, um, just so that people know hey, for the whole township, this is where I need to go, not I need to go follow every department. 
And then also kind of like I spoke, I spoke of before that we aren't using all of the strategies right now. Um, in the future, we really would like to fully implement the communication toolbox. So hopefully there might be a point in the future that we get to where we're using all of those things at different times. And then the last one is to encourage staff training on public participation. Um, staff from the township is going to training all the time on different things and really we hope that by putting this plan into place that more departments will send their um, employees and training on how to better engage with the community um, just throughout the process of developing the township. Um, so that is the main body of the plan. Um, if you look at the appendix, there are two ways for us to evaluate how this plan is working and um, how it can be updated. One is an internal public participation evaluation that would be filled out by, town, by township staff um, following any community engagement events um, that can just say, hey, did this work how we thought it was gonna work? Did we get the answers we thought we were going to get? That way we can look at it and decide if we should tweak what we're doing. And then there also is a community event satisfaction survey that is for um, people from the public who attended events to fill out. And that way we know what, we, what, we, what our aim was in this event. Did, did we hit that? Did we not hit that? Is this what people expected? Um, so that way we can improve that way too. And both of those surveys are, from, are adapted from the MEBC's guide also. And then finally, the very last part in the appendix and in the plan is the contact information for key stakeholders. Um, we have the address, phone number, and email for each of them. That way, if, um, say, a developer's looking at and they think, oh, I should probably speak to this key stakeholder, they have all the information right there, they don't have to go out and search for it. So that is the public partic participation plan, and I will be asking the commission to recommend it to the township board, but first I will be happy to answer any questions that the commission may have. Nice job, Chris. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Right. Comments and questions? Outstanding. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thanks for integrating our feedback. I know we had talked about uh, the discussion about what makes a large <coughs> development or what makes a controversial development project. So you, guys, uh, you put this in here very nicely large size relative to surrounding development proximity to the lake. Very good. Thank you. Anyone else? It made me think when I read through it, even though we're using the word controversial, um, when Menards came and approached us, there were a lot of things, a lot of steps to take and a lot of things that had to happen, including them going um, for some variances. And people in the community didn't understand that process and got very testy with us, didn't they, about how long it was taking and why we were holding them up. So it, just the fact that you outlined those key points that we talked about really made Menards fit that. It wasn't a controversial development, but it was a large development and people didn't have a full understanding of the scope and what it would take to make it happen. So had we had this in place and followed your guidelines, things might have been a little better. It's good. I also wanted to note that um, I received an email today from MSU Extension about uh, public engagement workshops that are coming up here this fall. Oh, so um, maybe we want to pass that word along too. All right. Anyone in the audience want to speak to this agenda item? Director Akers, you must be pretty proud. I think Ms. Moore did an awesome job. Mm -hmm. No, really, I mean, this, this is, it, you know, it, it, the plan turned out really well. The content is, is really good in the plan. Um, it's easy to follow. It's a usable plan. I know a lot of times when we look at those type of plans, you know, occasionally some of those plans will should sit on the shelf. Um, this is a plan that's easy to follow that people will be able to use that I'll use. So it's it's tremendous graphically. You know, the template look that uh, Miss Moore design looks great. So I think all around it's wonderful. Great. Anything? Any direction for it? Okay. Is there a motion? There's a motion. We need a recommendation to the township board. So moved. Oops. Support. <laughs> motion, Mr. Uh, Commissioner Boynton. Support, Commissioner Char. Any discussion on the motion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, none. And the motion carries. And thank you. Thank you very much from all of us. I overlooked that. I didn't know we had an Okay. <laughs> well, it goes to Township Board. Do you know when it goes to Township Board, Director Akers? It will um, be going before the Township Board in 
I don't know the date of their December meeting, but it'll be going before them in December. Okay. We are to general discussion in tonight's agenda. Anyone in the commissioners have an item for general discussion? Staff? I just have a couple updates. Um, the next planning commission meeting is going to be November 14th. Uh, we're going to have two items on the agenda as of right now. Um, one is going to be the final site plan approval for Subaru. That's going to be on the agenda. And then one is going to be a preliminary site plan approval for uh, NIAPCO. They are uh, proposing to construct a 70,000 square foot industrial building uh, in front of their existing facility. So um, we had a staff review meeting actually this afternoon that went relatively well, and uh, that should be before you in November. Um, in addition to that, Subaru recently broke ground. Uh, they are going, they are, they have moving dirt around the site. They were digging out the detention pond today, and I believe we issued the building permit today. I know we reviewed and approved the plans for the foundation. Um, they still have to submit for the remainder of the building, but we reviewed and approved plans for the foundation. So uh, if they don't have it in hand today, they will within the next few days. So, so we're moving right along on that. Good. Thank you. Anyone in the audience? General discussion item. All right. There's nothing else. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Mr. Boynton, support? Support. Support. Commissioner Franklin. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. We're adjourned. Good job, everyone.